Hi, thank you all for coming. Welcome to Brown Bag Lit. Brown Bag Lit. We're really happy to see you here. I'm Chloe and I co-founded Brown Bag Lit with Shasta Grant. I wanted to give you a quick introduction to Brown Bag Lit. We offer free online classes and event, free online events like this one, classes, a writing accountability time on Wednesdays and more. You can find everything on our website, brownbaglit.com, which I'll put into the chat. Our next class will be one exploring issues of privacy in writing with me on Thursday, March 21st from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the next event will be a spotlight on day eight and poet Reggie Kabiko for Poetry Month on April 12th from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll also be joined by editor Greg Luce, who's here as well. Thank you for coming. Uh -huh. So on to the show for today. Please join me in welcoming poet Sarah R. Burnett author of this beautiful book, and therapist Rachel Noble. And I'll put their full bios and information into the chat. In the meanwhile, I would just like to say I really greatly admire Sarah's poetry, encourage you to check out this award-winning book, um, which is so beautiful. And Rachel Noble is an insightful therapist that you will definitely enjoy hearing from today, as well as an essayist and writer. So first, if you could please stay muted during the discussion, keep the chat open, ask questions, follow along with the links and share anything that you really enjoy about what you're hearing. Um, after each presenter speaks for a bit, we'll have a QA and a and I'll be moderating and pulling from the questions that I see in the chat throughout. So be sure to keep, keep the chat open and share any questions you have. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sarah. Sarah? Hi, Chloe. Um, hi, Shasta. Thank you so much for creating this space. Um, it's really lovely to be here and lovely to be with Rachel paired with um, a therapist. Um, and I think it's really important. It's actually kind of how I got started writing poetry actually was um, my therapist uh, many, many years ago suggested, I was going through a difficult time, clearly um, suggested that I write about it. And at the time I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Write about it? I can't do that. But at the time I was a, I have a master's degree I was teaching high school English and she was like, yeah, right. I think you can. And I would give her a poem every week thereafter. So I was really, really, it feels like it's coming a little bit full circle um, to be here today. Um, my plan is today to read a few poems, poems that um, uh, are have been, were either difficult to write or about difficult subjects um, and kind of offer some tips for doing that and talk about maybe why I do that. Um, and one quote that I've had on my wall for quite some time is a quote from the poet Naomi Shihab Nye, and I'm going to read it now, um, and I hope that you hold it in your mind today as we, um, go through our time together. Very rarely do you hear anyone say they write things down and feel worse. It's an act that helps you preserves you, energizes you in the very doing of it. And that's from an interview that she gave with Krista Tippett on On Being, and I'd highly recommend the whole in interview. So I'm going to start off with um, a poem that I wrote from, um, from my book, Seed Celestial, published by Autumn House Press um, in 2022. It's called Enling. There's a man who cares for the last snail of its kind, Achignella apex fulva, knows precisely how much moisture, shade, and light it needs to thrive while it spends its dwindling time in a glass cabinet. Don't think about what you can start, think about what you can end, was the advice I heard on a time management podcast while slicing bananas for my daughter's breakfast. The banana comes from Guatemala, where its kind is plagued by the fusarium fungus to a possible, almost certain, if it continues, at this rate, extinction. I've never been to Guatemala, seen a rotting banana plant, or touched a snail's glossy shell of the kind that resembles the palate of a chocolate box. Dark brown, chestnut, white, the occasional splash of mint. I watch my daughter collect stones in her plastic bucket, clinking them beside her as she runs smiling from one corner of our yard to another. Impossible to say if this July is the warmest month since the last warmest month until it is. 
my dread a garden crawling with invasive insects. Later, she smashes bananas at the table between her dirt-crusted fingernails, laughs at the stickiness while I try to finish the article I started days ago about Acagnella apex fulva, whose largest threat is, you might have guessed, another snail. Euglandina rosea, aptly named for its rosy-hued carapace, who will follow the slimy trail of its gastropod cousin, then yank it from its shell with its serrated tongue and swallow it like Cronus, shell and all. When a species is the last of its kind, it's called an endling, a word that reminds me of changeling, such a fairy swap child I've called my own. I've made this place for her, warm, soft, a place that someday I'll not be allowed to enter, that may not even survive me. So this poem is a poem of grieving. And I got the inspiration from an article that I read in The Atlantic, The Last of Its Kind by the author Ed Young, who's a terrific writer. And I found it hard to sit with the subject matter, especially while sitting across from my then two-year-old daughter, or maybe she was one actually. But it's so hard um, to think about these things, ecological disaster being one of them. And writing about it, what it does is it gives me my voice back. It gives me some agency. You know, a poem or a story doesn't change things, but somehow writing about it helps me feel seen and heard. And like anyone who is in grief, you feel better knowing you're not alone in it. So one of the things is, one of my tips for today is to write about difficult things to feel better. The next poem I'm gonna read is um, a newer poem. It's called Mother With Her Hands Behind Her Back. Could have been any other day, the way she called us down impatient, put her hands behind her back and asked us to guess which one held the spatula which meant which one of us went first to measure, to stir, to pour. We'd played this game before. We wore clean aprons, hats, like the ones in books we read on her lap. In the kitchen, we mashed bananas, added chocolate chips, then the smell of bread baking in the oven. Outside, the smoke-filled sky shaded the sun blood orange. We wondered about the animals. Were they safe, like we were? Our mother licked the spoon, the one she said might make us sick. Could have been any other day, and then it was. What did we know then of those indoor days spent with her? What did we know then of those bright, sticky messes, the way she made everything at a distance seem to keep its distance? So this is a poem where I've created some distance around a traumatic event. Um, I wrote it pretty closely to when it happened. Many of you on the East Coast would probably remember the couple of days last year where we had to spend inside because of the Canadian wildfires. While I was stuck inside with my preschool age children who are unaware of the catastrophes of our climate right now. And what did we do? We made banana bread. And I had this image, of course, of this comforting scene of the home, but then outside you have to wear a mask because I'm afraid of damaging your lungs. And that's hard, that's another thing that's hard to sit with. But what can I do to write about it? I write about it to process it. And to, if you're writing about something that's close at hand, there's a couple things you can do. You can obviously let time do its work to create distance. But in fiction and in poetry, um, you can create fictionalized events. And in this case, I created a persona, a persona of the mother. She's almost like a portrait figure. And it's the children's voice that are speaking. So it's not even my own, it's, my, it's like me imagining my children speaking back years from now. Um, so these are all kind of ways that you can create a helpful distance from the event and still be able to write about it. And lastly, I'm gonna read one former poem. Um, 
And this is a poem that always has a reoccurring question for me, which is, how does life go on when there is so much suffering in this world? The poem is um, titled Yellow Rain Jacket and is dedicated to Chi Chi, a 13 year old female chimp. In the middle of a street, in the middle of a war, there's a zookeeper in Kharkiv who sits down next to Chi Chi coaxing her to return. She's incalcitrant, a toddler who won't leave the playground. I'm thinking of what's vital today, what makes birds come back in spring and what makes it possible for us to dream. I've seen far too many photos of burned up tanks, their hauled metal carcasses, desecrated landscapes with bare trees, milk gray skies, and men carrying body bags since for us, the journalists still shield our eyes. But this is the scene I keep returning to in the middle of a street, in the middle of a war. And if not for someone streaming it on a phone, it would have gone unnoticed, but instead it's viral. Which is why after I sat next to my daughter in the pre-dawn darkness explaining that monsters don't exist when clearly they do, I watched it from my bed. And this is the part that gets me. After a while, Chi Chi walks away. It's almost a game, almost fun. Will the keeper follow? Give chase in the middle of a street, in the middle of a war? There's so much for Chi Chi to explore in the world beyond her enclosure. The world that shocks her awake from her slumber with its thunderous explosions, sirens, and terrifying lights. But here in this moment, almost normal, there's parked cars, people walking by in no particular hurry. And then it starts to rain, slow, then heavy, and Chi Chi starts bounding on all fours towards the zookeeper who's waiting for her, holding a yellow rain jacket. It's almost a scene lifted from Curious George. And she helps Chi Chi put it on, fitting her ape arms into child sized sleeves. And this is what I do every day fit small arms into sleeves. And maybe that's why I'm fixated on this tender act in the middle of a street, in the middle of a war, this needful act spotlighted, its kindness, pure and blazing in its brilliance. We're captivated by it with our likes and our shares. And this is the best part the zookeeper has a bicycle for her. And Chi Chi's riding it with almost a smile, and the zookeeper is bent over at her side. She's steering the handlebars for her to someplace safer, we hope, someplace almost like a home. I will never answer that question of how life goes on when there is so much suffering, but in the space of a poem or a story or genitive writing, you get to process it. You get to turn it over like a stone in your hand again and again, and you give it a shape and you give it a name and you get to look at it a little bit differently and you get to shed light on the parts you want to shed light on. So for me, the part I needed to shed light on in that particular moment was Chi Chi and this yellow rain jacket and arguably other people needed to see that too. That's why it went viral. That's why media outlets picked up on it. So, you know, writing this poem helped me do that. And then it helped me go about my day. So, you know, write what you need to hear too. And if you don't know what you need to uh, hear, <laughs> you don't know what you need at that moment, uh, I would say just write and um, I'm pretty sure the page will let you know. Um, so with that, I'm gonna leave it now to Rachel who has some great uh, presentation for you in store. Amazing, beautiful, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, that was lovely. Can you guys hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So let me, um, thank you, thank you very much for that. That was just absolutely lovely, moving, just sitting here, got little chills, thank you very much. Um, the, and it speaks very nicely, dovetails with what I'm going to go over. Mine isn't nearly as lyrical and lovely and warm, but it's, 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 it's got a lot of um, practicality to it. So let's get started. Okay. So let me get, let me do the little, I got to put on my old lady glasses and let me share my screen and find my presentation and open it up. All right. Can everybody see, can you guys see my slideshow. 
Yeah, good. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So let's get started. So let me start with a simple um, move forward. Move forward. Is it moving forward? It's not moving forward. How do I make it move forward? There it goes. Okay. Here we go. Yay. This is me. Let me do a little introduction. My name is Rachel Noble. I am a, can you guys see me? Am I okay? I'm good. Okay. Cause on my screen, my thing is frozen. So I am a therapist, writer, and presenter. I am based in Washington, DC, and my specialties include women's mental health, chronic pain and medical concerns, and resilience and burnout. I was educated up at and trained up at Hopkins, up in Baltimore. So today, the things that I really want to make sure we talk about today is resilience, um, suffering and joy, and its relationship with joy, um, making memories, our house rules, how we find out how to take control over things when we feel like we're not in control and remembering the power that we have. Um, the power of narrative therapy, which gets back to um, the power of writing things down to help us process and get things to a better place. And if we find that all of these things don't help us, how to find help and reach out for help. And then we have some handouts at the end. So we're gonna cover a lot of information um, quickly, but if you just get one thing out of this, that's your win, just, just one thing. Um, so let's start with uh, disaster, Katrina. Um, I'm sure we all remember Katrina and the aftermath was devastating of the images that we saw. There was a journalist that went down after Katrina and she interviewed a bunch of people to see, you know, to show how this was impacting people's daily lives and just the destruction and the horror. And she went back 10 years later and she interviewed um, the same people that she had interviewed. And it was very interesting because the people who were children during Katrina, whether they were young kids or teenagers, um, they all had the same story. They all said, this was the best time of their life. This was the best time of their childhood and they absolutely loved it. And she was stunned. She was stunned that this was the consistent message that she got from these kids. And they all said this, she's like, why? Why in the world would this be your favorite time of your childhood? And they all, all the kids said the same thing. They said, cause everybody was just home and we were all just together and we weren't running all over the place and we could all just be together. And so the, the message I love in this is that even when we might think it's the most horrible thing going on, it's, 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 it's those little gifts that we get out of it. We all continue to find the good. And sometimes it's a gift to have everything slowed down. So this brings us to the conversation of resilience. Resilience is the capacity to rebound from adversity stronger and more capable. It's a practice. It's something that we work at every day. And happiness and resilience, they nurture each other. The more resilient we are, the more happier we are. So our job as individuals and as parents and as, as people in the world is to, it's like no matter what life throws our way, it's to find and reclaim our resilience because ultimately that nurtures our happiness and how we impact the world. Um, it's suffering is needed for joy. Um, sometimes people will say, you know, if they're suffering, are they failing at joy? Am I not, am I, am I not doing it right? And happiness is actually um, when you're suffering well, when even, again, even the challenges that are coming at us, um, just like uh, Sarah said, finding that beautiful little moment out of, some, out of a disaster, that's suffering well, that's resilience. Um, and it seems that there's really no true suffering, uh, sorry, no, no true happiness without suffering. And one of my favorite examples of this is childbirth. You know, there's no better stronger bond than between a, a parent and a child. And there's no, for a lot of people, more greater suffering than the experience of childbirth and so, and or pregnancy or what have you. So that's just a really nice example. And we all know that to be a good writer, you have to live, you have to hurt, and you have to experience all that life has. And when you're having these difficult moments, remember uh, you're making memories, you know, I, I, you know, how many times do you have like a family trip and everybody's going somewhere and the things that we remember are, oh, remember when we missed the train or, oh, remember when such and so, you know, threw up in the back of the car or, oh, when, 
you know, when we got there and we couldn't get into the building or what have you, this is, these are the things that we remember. So when you're going through your day and you're going through your life and something bad happens, just turn and look at that person that's next to you and say, you know what, we're making memories because this is going to be what we remember moving forward. And no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on around you, it's very important for you to remember your house rules. Where is your power? Just like Sarah says, where she, when she's feeling, you know, she's really struggling with something, she takes it and she writes it down. That's her power. How do you see your power? Can you find it? And there's all kinds of ways to find your power. And sometimes people do big things to help find their power, like go volunteer and do these grand actions. But there's those small ways that people find their power too, whether it's how they spend their money, how they recycle, how they use energy, what they drive, games they or dolls that they do or don't purchase, food that they do or don't purchase, et cetera. There's a lot of ways for us to reclaim and say, no, this is how I'm interacting with the world regardless. When you find that you're overwhelmed by what's going on in the world, make sure that you limit your exposure to media. You don't have to take it all in. Take in what you need to understand and let go of the rest. You know, turn off your devices when you don't need them. Wear a watch to check the time instead of your phone. Wait as long as you can for your kids to get a phone. Make sure that you're looking at the world through your own lens rather than other people's lens. These are all ways that we can reclaim our power and to set healthy boundaries with the world, with ourselves. And a boundary is something that you set that requires nothing of the other person. It doesn't matter what anybody does or doesn't come at you. When you have that healthy boundary set, you hold it. That is part of finding your power, regardless of what's going on. Narrative therapy. When you find that you're really, you know, you know, you're, you're trying to find the good in things, you're trying to find the resilience, you've set your house rules, you're finding your power, but you have those things in your head that just will not leave you alone. Those thoughts that just ruminate. When your brain holds on to something and keeps turning it over and over again in your mind, especially like at night when you can't sleep, it's actually, try, this is a bit of a safety mechanism. This is something your brain is doing to try to help you stay vigilant so you don't forget about it because then it'll help keep you safe. There's this beautiful power in writing it down. When you take something that your brain is just will not let go of and you write it down, your brain knows it's safe. You're not gonna forget it. It's not gonna get you again. You can The brain can let it go. That's a really nice way to help process a feeling so, it's, so you can get it off of you and not let it hold on to occupy so much of your mental space. And you can process these feelings. And again, there's lots of different ways to do this with narrative therapy. And this you can Google this and find it. You'll find things on it right away. And I put together a small list of prompts for narrative therapy. And um, actually I have a handout that's gonna come out at the end of the presentation that has more. But for example, you could write just a simple highlights reel of like tragic moments or scary moments or those little fearful thoughts in your head. They can even be as simple as one sentence and then you can go back and flesh them out later is the ones that really resonate, the things that really hurt, but it's nice to just get them down. Um, it's nice to write a letter to your younger self. You know, what would you say to yourself at 16 years old? What would you say to yourself at eight years old? What would you say to yourself at 24 years old? How, what, what lessons would you give? And it's helpful to think about yourself at that time you know, think about your favorite shirt that you wore. Think about your favorite snack that you ate. Think about the blanket that was on your bed to help you get in the mindset of what were you like back then and what would you want to say to yourself? Um, it's good to write a letter um, to your uh, a dear mom letter. What would you write to your mom and what would your mom write to you? What would your mom say to you about a specific event? Um, it's helpful to write a letter to a predator, so to someone that you know hurt you. What would you say to that person if they were here right now? What do you want them to know? Um, write about a time when you were afraid to go home. Write about a moment that you felt helpless. Write about a time when you knew something was over. All of these, these things are just starts. They're just ways to begin this conversation of processing these things in your mind. You might be surprised that comes out what comes out and you really wanna look for patterns in not just these events, but how you respond to these events because then it helps you understand yourself um, and think about how they shape you today. Think about the, the way that they might impact you in a negative way, but even more importantly, think about 
the strengths that you gained from these moments and how they help you um, be stronger. What good came out of this bad? Write it all down. It's helpful. And as I'm saying all this to you and you're listening to me and you're just feeling stuck and all this just feels overwhelming and like too much, or you've tried these things in the past without success, this might be a sign that you are struggling and you need help. So please be sure that you ask for help. I'm also sending out um, at the end of this, a list of mental health resources and little simple self-care tips. I'm sending out, or Chloe is gonna send out a list of emotion words. Um, I love this list of emotion words. It's four pages of emotion words and it's everything from, yay, it's a beautiful day, sunshine, lollipops to, yeah, I'm about to jump off that bridge and everything in between. And it's really helpful for uh, in therapeutic sessions for me, because I'll have people scan it and see what resonates, but also as writers, because they're really good, juicy words. Um, and there's a handout on narrative therapy. And then this is just a list of books that I like um, that get around these conversations of resilience and uh, narrative therapy. The first one is Thinking About Memoir that was written by Abigail Thomas, lovely little book of prompts and, and the power of of processing your own stuff through writing. Um, the Blessing of a Skin Knee is a nice, and, and um, The Gift of Failure. These are both very nice books that look at, uh, from the parent perspective, how important it is to let your children suffer, to help build their own strength, build their own resilience, and ultimately build their own happiness. And that's it. That's my presentation today. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I'm going to stop sharing, and I think we're going to pivot to questions. That was really great, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, for both of you, if you want to look through the chat now, or I can share it with you afterwards, there's been some nice feedback, including um, Serena was saying that during COVID, she started a journal for her daughter, um, writing to her daughter. And then um, Sarah was adding that they, there was some writing together with her child, her children. Um, so I don't see any actual direct questions in the chat just yet. So I'll start, but you guys are more than welcome to put questions into the chat or raise your little yellow Zoom hand, whatever it's called. Um, so the first question specifically for Sarah, thinking about writing. And I love what you said about the persona poem and the distance and someone commented on that in the chat. And I was wondering how you decide how much distance, how close you can be while keeping the emotional heart but also making it safe for you. And it sounds like you're specifically writing about the moment, something that's really close that has not allowed time to distance yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, yeah, if I'm, if I'm writing about something that I experienced myself and it was traumatic, um, then I will usually be okay, excuse my French, to write a shitty first draft, and that's great. Um, and just get it down. Um, and then if it's something that I really went through, you know, I mean, I often just let that simmer and just having to written it down. And if I want to revisit it, I can. But um, I think what you're also maybe indirectly asking is is the question of why, why do you write and why do you publish? Um, you know, why I write, um, has nothing to do with why I published. It's, um, it keeps me sane. It's how I process things. It's how I, um, am able to, to stay grounded, gives me power, gives me agency, all these things that we've kind of been talking about, but why I might choose, and it helps me and why I might choose to send a poem out into the world is because I think it might help others. And I think what we, what we also know is true is that things that, you know, anyone who's a caregiver knows you, you gotta you gotta take care of yourself first before you can take care of others. And very often, I found it's true that things that have helped me in writing the poem um, are are helpful to others. The other people feel seen and heard too, um, and that's very that's a different experience. Very gratifying as a writer. Um, so. I think you're, I think, I hope I'm answering your question, but giving it time and distance sometimes, you know, through, through time is, is what you need to do. And then at other times you can try those tricks that I was talking about, like persona or, 
approaching it from or, or making up a story um that might help you um process it in the moment nice thank you um following that and relatedly rachel and then maybe back to sarah on the sim similar question thinking of narrative therapy and the writing and telling your story in order to separate it from yourself at what point if ever would you recommend then sharing some of that with someone else um is there a point kind of i think maybe the maybe the craft questions for both of you as you're both doing some writing um, of different kinds when something begins as therapy and then it how it translates into something that might be published or at least shared with someone close to the author this is a question to me yeah <laughs> yeah so this is going to be really like what the person is comfortable with and what the person um is hoping to gain from it i can tell you with the writing i have some um clients that write and share things just with me because they're 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 just it de it depends on the purpose you know uh, some things are so personal and so private and so they're so afraid of letting them out. They know they have to let it out to open up. You know, there's this nice simple phrase of you have to get things out, get the bad out to make space to let the good in. And that's kind of an oversimplified way to say it, but it really does make a difference to just sometimes just get the bad out, whether you speak it or write it or what have you, and then have space to process it. And then you just, it frees up so much mental space to let the good in and then figure out what to do with this. So um, I have some people who will share things with me that have been written just for a therapeutics um, point. And then for one reason or another, over time, you know, just as Sarah said, they have, they develop this level of comfort with it, where what I'll, the way I describe it is things, you know, when they're in our heads and they're nowhere else and they're causing us a lot of pain, especially if it's a personal um, difficult event, it's often wrapped up in shame whether it's what we intend or not. There's these these there's this element of that, but when you can write about it or speak it or bring it in, bring shed light on it and figure out what to do with it, it pivots it from this place of shame to just a fact. This is just something that happened to me or this is just something I experienced in my life. And when you realize that this is just a part of your history, then it gets to a place where you recognize, as Sarah said, that that processing this was so helpful for me, it might help somebody else. And that's when I see people say, you know what, I think I need to figure out something to do with this. I'm either going to use this and share it with the people that are closest with me, or even share it and get things published. I have more than one client that's gotten their work published over time. But again, it's, it's, it's very much a process, but, but getting it down on paper is the first step. Thank you. We keep coming back to time and then creating something new. Sarah, do you want to say something about the crafting of something more personal or maybe therapeutic into something you share? And then we have a question from Greg and Serena. Uh, yeah, I want to say other um also want to touch on another point too, which is the idea of generative writing, which is just just setting a timer for 10 minutes and just writing and let's let whatever it is like you know this is what Rachel was saying kind of like a brain dump, you know, getting it all on out going getting it out of you. Um it can be a really stress reliever. It can be an escape. Um, I recommend putting your phone on airplane mode. Um, this reminds me of the morning, you know, um, Julia Cameron's Artist's Way, that famous book, um, and the morning pages. A lot of, I don't do morning pages. I don't do generative writing every day. I'm not that, I'm not an everyday writer, um, nor do I do this, but I found that in, times when I am stuck writing or that I am trying to process too many things at one time, that this is a very helpful tool to have. So um, that's to that point. Um, yeah. And what did, did I answer? Did you have any more questions with that? <laughs> no, you got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a question for Greg, which I think is really interesting for those of us who also Teach, he says, question for Rachel, how do your clients, especially the non-writers, respond to your suggestions concerning writing? And do you have writers or other type of artists among your clientele? And how do they take your ideas? Do any of the writers come to you with writer's block? Um, so any aspect of that? 
Sure, the non-writers come up with just really beautiful, very uh, raw, just emotional things, which I love. Um, the writers actually have quite a few artists of one kind or another, not just writers. Um, the writers are 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 funny. They they get more um, like they want it to be writing. <laughs> I want to be like, ah, oh, just get it out on the page. Just you know, just just get it out of you, kind of thing. And they're like, well, it needs this, it needs that, da 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 da. And they just get more concerned about that. And it's interesting. Even artists that I have, they're either visual artists or. Um, uh, musicians, um, they have this higher level of expectation on themselves that to me can be, um, it can be a block in and of itself because they have this, they just have these expectations, um, that someone that hasn't had something published, they don't have that in them. Uh, writer's block. Yes, we definitely, I definitely have people that get writer's block or get blocked with whatever uh, creative field that they're in. And um, we go back to basically like remember before you were um, known for whatever this thing is that you create and go back to just doing it just for you and don't think about it, your audience and don't think about any of these other things and just think about what, what feeds your soul, what's in you. And then that usually helps get people to a place where they're ready to um, create again. That's the simplest way to say it. Yeah. Oh. I love that. Our audience initially is maybe always ourselves after all. Mm -hmm. um, Serena has a question for both of you. Maybe we can start with Sarah. Do either of you freeze during periods of trauma and how do you unfreeze creatively or get, um, get someone or something to unfreeze if writing isn't working? What are other things or options? Well, my, my therapist tells me to write about it. No, <laughs> <laughs> usually gets it going. No, um, um, no, um, yes, I am, um, like an example, like honestly, um, giving birth to my first child, I was so, it was like the rug was pulled underneath me. Um, and I know that was like a, it's not a traumatic event when you think about it, but there's definitely an identity loss there and a shift that happens. So, I mean, I didn't write for definitely a year. Um, and you know, I think that that's fine. Like I said, I'm not a, someone who writes every day. I just, um, but I do try to block it in now. I'm a little more, much more intentional about it. Um, and that's okay. I think, um, like I said, the generative writing is one way that I've been using recently, but back then I was just trying to keep afloat. Um, the writing will come when, when you're ready. And if that's the, um, process the the sort of venue that's that's best for you you know it might be drawing it might be something else it might be woodworking it might be crochet I don't know can I pipe in on this one yeah so you're kind of I don't want to say you're supposed to freeze during traumas but you're kind of supposed to freeze during traumas you know when, when there's a trauma there's these it 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 sparks the amygdala and you have like fight or flight you know, and a lot of people freeze and whether, especially when you're processing new information, it can be overwhelming. Um, if you can, if you want to write and you can get down even one sentence that day saying, well, this bad thing happened, you know, just, just a fact, not necessarily emotions wrapped around it. Great. But if not, that's okay. This is a huge part of experiencing something horrifying is that it takes a while before all the parts and pieces of it kind of settle down in your head and then you can you can have some sort of reflection on it you know you can have some sort of insight on it but when you're just in it the the kind of freezing that's just that's just you're just trying to survive you're just in survival mode and that's okay and and sarah to your point your first childbirth actually is often a traumatic thing it is a massive identity shift um, it's amazing how much you change as a human, everything about you disappears and it's all about the baby. And for a lot of people, for most people, that's a really massive change. And it has all these societal expectations of you're just supposed to be joyous and giddy and happy. And oh, I'm so happy I have a new mom. And that's not always how it goes. That's actually usually how it is. It isn't how it goes. And so it, it is a lot of just processing what you're experiencing and literally just surviving. And that's okay. So don't be freaked out if you freeze and you can't write every day. As Sarah was saying, we, we take care of ourselves first in order to then move forward and do other things. Um, Ken asks, I think specifically for Rachel, how do writing and talking go together in narrative therapy? 
how do writing, writing and talking go together? There, that's a good question. Um, it, uh, the simplest way to describe it is writing and talking actually use two different parts of your brain. And the more parts of your brain that you can use to deal with an issue, the more likely you're going to get it to, again to move out of that space of um, raw emotion to something I can do something with. So it's literally just a different way to look at it. Um, I find also in um, writing, uh, we're talking about what somebody's written in a therapeutic setting. I'll have somebody will give, will send me something ahead of time, and I'll read it before the session, and then we'll talk about it in session. Um, that often what they wrote is a sliver of what it really was. And it takes them a while to get to where they actually get to the most deep, painful part of it. And it's easier to say it than to write it. Um, and so it helps us like just sort of get to that next level of level, level of depth within whatever that topic is to get us closer to where that actual, and this is why this keeps <laughs> making me trip or fall or hit my face or whatever the thing is. Um, or this is why this keeps hurting me in any way. Following that question, Sarah, do you have other activities or arts that help to bolster or support the writing when you might get stuck? Yeah, any anything that supports a beginner's mindset, I found. So um, I took up writing picture books because to, to your point about freezing and things too, um, because it was like learning it from scratch. So it was fun and there was no stakes. Um, I crocheted you know, learn, taught, taught himself to crochet, you know, I mean, things that with no stakes and where you're a beginner, um, again, um, I find that really helpful. Um, I, I actually do have a question for Rachel that came up during our conversation that I think would be helpful um, because uh, I had asked her when we were preparing, I was like, well, is there any, is there ever a, a danger of sort of re-traumatizing yourself when you're writing about a traumatic situation? And my answer then and still is no, it's, yeah. it's good. <laughs> um, people worry about re-traumatizing themselves. Um, and that, uh, it, it's true that it's gonna, it, it's gonna bring up painful feelings when you are processing or writing about a, a trauma, a piece of your history that was painful. Um, there's a reason we work really hard to push these things down. We work really hard to like suppress it so we can like just get on with our day. It's, it's a very natural coping mechanism that we all have, but sometimes whatever the thing is, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of energy to push that thing down. And when we finally let it out and try to figure out what to do with it and hold it up to the light, it can be exhausting. It can be what people often feel uh, that they might think be might be something akin to re-traumatizing themselves is the actual fatigue from like, okay, I can let down, I can let go of all these guards and all these shields that I've been using to force this thing down and keep it down. Um, I let them go and you realize, okay, I'm exhausted from holding on to all of this. So that's often what people feel, but the notion of re-traumatizing, um, I, I have yet to see that happen and I've yet to to, and if somebody knows of some research or something on that, please send it along, but I haven't seen that one. Thank you. Serena asks, what kinds of boundaries should you have when sharing trauma in writing and how much is too much or is it never too much? Who is that question for? Um, I think either one. Do you want to start, Rachel? I don't think there's too much. I don't think there's such a thing as too much. I find that when people... So first of all, you got to write what you're comfortable with, right? And and sometimes you just have to write the surface level stuff to just get it out of the way. And then you dig deeper and deeper till you get to the stuff that's the raw stuff. Um, is there such a thing as sharing too much? I have yet to see that. What I find is the, pe the thing that people think is the scariest, most horrible, awful thing that's ever happened to them and it's never happened to anybody else and so on and so forth. It's just not true. It, 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 there's, you know, humans are, uh, we're, we're much more similar than, than we think. Um, and, and if we've experienced it, someone else has experienced either it or something like it or pieces of it that they can relate to and that helps normalize what they're experiencing so that they can help find voice around whatever it is that they're dealing with. So that's my short answer on that one. Mm -hmm. I would just add that um, if I ever feel in the process, like it's too much for me, 
like that's um you know I think I think I I, I try to take a you know take a break or go for a walk um that's that's my usual go-to if I can or maybe my days are very busy with two kids too so maybe you know if I only have 15 minutes that day maybe that's not the day to talk about a really traumatic event that happened um maybe I'll save that for a day when I've got two or three hours um to go into it and then another thing that I've been doing lately because the world is really heavy right now um is I've been intentionally trying to write into joy because that's what I need. I need to see joy and light. And um, so sometimes I've been, you know, today I'm gonna I'm gonna write a poem that is funny today, and, and that's just a, just because I need it. Um, um, so I think it's knowing where you are too in your writing. If today's a day that you can handle it, that you want to go into something that's difficult, um, or or not. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that one more. Always give yourself the time, whether it's in writing or it's in therapy or what have you. If you know you have something big, make sure you give yourself space, time before and after and don't push it and only do it when you're ready because it, 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 it won't come out right. Thank you. On the um, thought of using humor, Sarah was talking about, can add some therapists also use humor as well. Um, so I'm really taken by what you were saying, Rachel, of taking these big feelings in your heart or your mind and then putting them onto paper or aloud in talk therapy, and then they become facts and they kind of transition in their emotional strength. So thinking about writing where maybe the piece needs to be in that difficult emotional place, how, and this is for both of you, how would you recommend after kind of the basics are written and you as a human are feeling better, how do you kind of re-enter into that emotional space to keep adding or trimming and editing and molding that work? Either one can start. I feel like I'm actually writing a poem like that right now. Um, it's a poem that I um, started uh, like a year ago. Um, it was a traumatic event where I was witness to a shooting with my two kids next to me. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very traumatic. And I wrote, a, you know, I wrote about it and wrote about it. And then I just recently started to go back to that poem. And it is, it is, it is a very different poem now because it feels like I know the purpose of why I would want to send it out into the world. Um, and it's to give highlight to the very everyday reality that shootings are having on our lives in mass um and to show that in a very intimate way um so that that particular poem needed time with a big t it needed a year at least a year i'm still working on it yeah. And what I would add to that is uh, what I find is that people find it actually easier. Like once you get the scariest part down, even if it's just the first scariest sentence about whatever the thing is that is the most painful part to you, like, or once you start to put it on paper and you go back to it to give it more shape and give it more details and edit it, make it beautiful and what have you, um, it, it it gets easier and easier and easier because now it becomes this, it becomes your, it becomes your work. Again, it transitions from this thing um, that has all this raw power over you to this thing that, okay, I can do something with this. I have power over this. It doesn't control me. I control it. Um, and it's very cathartic. It's very empowering. Um, you know, I think about um, someone like Simone Biles who went through all of this horrible sexual trauma. And then eventually what she got to the point where she could talk about it and talk about it, you know, in front of lots of people and help try to create change around this and so on and so forth. It transitioned from, it will always have this part in her, obviously that's pain, but it transitioned into this factual part of her history. And then she figured out how to turn it into something really, really powerful. Um, and then that's what happens when you bring things out of the darkness and put, a, and put light on them. Thank you for articulating that for me. <laughs> uh, 
This is so engaging and interesting. Thank you guys. We have another question um, from Ken. He says, historically, I would think that the blues present a model of sharing difficulties through music, having a therapeutic impact. And that's not unlike what Rachel and Sarah are talking about. Um, that's not a question, but that's an interesting statement. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to follow up. Rachel at one point said something to the effect of boundaries require nothing of the other person. And this was emphasized in, in the chat and this goal of us, this constant theme of empowerment. And we have the power to set these boundaries regardless of others' actions, perhaps. Um, what do we do when our, our stories almost inevitably interact with other humans and their stories and their versions and their privacy and expectations or levels of healing or um, what have you. What kinds of recommendations do you have for, I know Sarah's, Sarah and I have talked a lot about writing better children as parents and what decisions you're making about either for yourself or your writing or advising others to keep those boundaries or respect the others in some way. Sarah? Um, for me personally, I try to keep the focus, if I'm writing with my children in the poem, which many of them are, I try to keep the focus on me and my, pro if I'm going through an inter, I cannot think for them, I cannot show their thoughts or what they're feeling, um, I can show what happened, um, and I'm, but the, the, the focus is on the speaker of the poem, um, if I'm writing about my parents the same I just keep the focus on the speaker of the poem and I can give details but I'm not going to presume to think for the other person or to take away that or to speak for that other person yeah nicely said uh the the thing I would add to my favorite um example of this by the way or sort of taking it and going to in the next step is uh the book educated mm -hmm. um she did such a good job of going back, you know, historically and interviewing the people and saying, this is how I remember this. Do you, how do you remember it? And she actually saw often that the things from her childhood memory um, were, were not what other people, how they experienced it, but it didn't matter because it was her truth. Mm -hmm. It was her truth. It was her experience. It's how she saw it. It's how it impacted her. It's how it impacted the next these next actions in her life. And so, you know, when, and that's true of any event, you know, anytime, you know, this is why uh, one eyewitness is useless. They don't even use it in court because it doesn't matter sort of what one person saw it's what's that collective story, but it starts with my story. What is my story? How did I see this and how did this impact me? Um, and that's, and as long as you stay there with it, and yes, there's sometimes that my story might not can, you know, be congruent with someone else's story, but that's okay. Then they get to write their story. They can write it too, you know, but with that one, um, obviously, yes, you want to be thoughtful of it, but to Sarah's point, as long as you keep it in first person and you say, this was my experience, no one can deny your experience. And then the other big, big, big aside to this one, because I just saw David Sedaris interviewed about this the other day, and this is a horrible thing to say, but he said it. So he said, it's great when people die. <laughs> <laughs> he was referring to his father because after he died, he just went nuts. He, he let loose with the writing on that one. But, but as long as, again, it's your, per, it's your first person, it's your story, it's your truth, it's your reality. It is. Mm -hmm. And there are also ways, you know, the persona, again, the persona poem or writing from the perspective of myth or creating a fictionalized story, but it's really about your story. I mean, if you really want to create that veneer, you're right, you know, it doesn't have to be memoir. I do think, especially in poetry, everyone assumes that all that we write is true and memoir, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. Um although maybe the emotional truths always are, but then they're in different settings. So we just have a couple of minutes left. I was thinking about how Sarah was saying, you write what you want to read. If you would both like to share what's next or something that's on your plate that you're thinking about writing that you're able to share, um, that would be great. And I will put your links again into the chat. Thank you guys. Um, I know that I have an event actually with Chloe, if you're in the area locally, um, in Tacoma Park. Um, Chloe, do you remember the gallery's name? I'm forgetting it. 
Do you remember? I mean, like maybe you can oh, put a I don't there. remember, but I'll look for it. Uh, uh, but there was a reading coming up there that we're doing on women in landscape. Um, uh, right, right now I'm just working on another batch of poems and I keep on writing picture books. Um, uh, that's my way of helping my child through childhood, you know? Okay, well, this is the book that she might need to read. So I'm gonna try to write that book. Um, so those are the things that um, I'm working on writing wise. Uh, I'm working on a, a four part series on pulling back the veil on mental health care, like what it looks like, everything from what it like feels like to sit on the couch to what it feels like to take meds to what it's like to be in an inpatient psychiatric unit, um, because it's, there's a lot of, I think, confusion around it and a lot of misunderstanding. So I'm working on that for like the my professional writing, my personal writing, I'm working on my memoir. Um, and I'm going to be doing a two week getaway to go spend some time focused on that, that I'm looking forward to. So, um, but that's always much harder for me to do than the professional stuff. We all struggle. We all, it's always a process for all of us. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate